Welcome to the Hemophilia Council of California's Advocacy and Policy Webinar. This is our virtual Legislative Day 2021 um, virtual advocacy primer. So with that, I would like to introduce Randy Kleitz. Randy is an advocate in the bleeding disorders community. She is from Ohio and um, became um, active in the bleeding disorders community when her son Colton was born. And um, rather than go through all of her bio, I'm going to let Randy share her story. Um, and I know you're going to be encouraged to hear um, what she has to say. And um, I hope it's inspirational as we get ready to, to embark on our legislative day as she can give you um, some of her story and how she first got involved in the bleeding disorders community. So Randy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, so much for the opportunity to um, speak to you all. I am super excited for the opportunity and I am really, really passionate about advocacy and especially for those of you who are really uncomfortable with advocacy because that's where I started out. Um, and so it's always great to share a little bit about my personal journey um, just because I think that you know, there's a lot of us who come into this community um, with no family history, and it's a little bit overwhelming. So I'm going to share a little bit about my uh, backstory. So I am the youngest of four. I'm from a small town in rural Ohio. Uh, my parents were married for 43 years when my dad passed away at 62 years old. Um, as I said, I am the youngest of four children. Um, I'm the big baby in the family. I have a big age group between me and my siblings. And I say that because uh, if any of you are the youngest in your family, you also know how uh, being the youngest sometimes makes you, uh, it really does, uh, you know, really um, kind of draw in your personality. And for me, I am used to, my older siblings are 11, 14, and 18 years older than me. So I kind of grew up with them being so much older than me that I really didn't have much uh, impact in the family conversations because I was so young when they were all teenagers. Um, but then I grew up kind of like an only child, but then spoiled by my three older siblings. So I really get, um, was super spoiled. Um, I married my high school sweetheart uh, when we were 19. So we waited a little bit after high school, but we started dating when we were 15. And all I really wanted to do while I was growing up was be a mom. And so for me, uh, when my husband and I got married at 19, we knew that that was too young, um, potentially for family. Right at that time, we were both kind of not ready for kids. Um, so I was a nanny. I had uh, two families that I worked for over the next few years. Um, but then finally, I became a mom. Um, so my son Colton was born when I was 27 years old. This is my guy here. Um, and so we were really excited um, whenever I got pregnant. And then uh, when he was born, we knew that there was something a little bit um, off with his bleeding patterns. It took us two weeks to get a diagnosis of severe hemophilia A. Um, and we went home with a book uh, by Lori Kelly uh, about uh, hemophilia. And uh, for the next year, we really just kind of tried to find our way through the hemophilia community. Uh, and so I, uh, pretty much just stayed home, read what I could. It was 2002, so read what I could on the internet, uh, read that book like my Bible, um, and then about a year and uh, Colton started bleeding pretty regularly at that point. And so we started the life of a severe hemophiliac, going to the hospital quite frequently, um, trying to learn how to access a clotting factor um, from home. My husband's an electrician for a small business, so just managing um, how to find access to clotting factor um, with a small employer was quite difficult in the early 2000s. Uh, the Affordable Care Act hasn't, hadn't come yet, so we had a lifetime cap and we had annual caps, so we were trying to make sure that we stayed under that. And then unfortunately, when he was uh, 15 months old, he started getting really sick and we didn't know what was going on. And it took about a month to get a diagnosis of leukemia. And so then he started three and a half years of chemotherapy. And um, fortunately, he did really well throughout his treatment um, for leukemia, but that really made me step up my game in advocating for children with special health care needs. Um, and so I... Um, did so through a couple different ways. Um, I got really involved at the children's hospital that Colton was seen at. Um, so I 
I was a parent mentor and then I started getting really involved in the Parent Advisory Council. Uh, and then through the Parent Advisory Council, I got connected to our children's program. I think you guys call it CCS in um, California, but in, uh, in Ohio, it's called the Children's Medical Handicaps Program through our Department of Health. And so I started serving um, on that on that council, um, just making sure that middle income families could access the care that they needed um, through no fault of their own. A lot of times there's just really high medical costs and I know all of you know where that comes from. Um, so just trying to make sure that we had access to uh, what we needed to have access to became kind of my focus because I knew Children's Hospital was taking care of his leukemia and his hemophilia the best that they could. I learned how to infuse at home. And so we were doing um, infusions uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday at home. He was going to the hospital for his chemo treatment at least twice, sometimes three times a week. Um, so those first few years were really difficult. Uh, we got um, safety net that we had. Um, and so we got through those years and then I really found my way in advocacy. So I started volunteering with our treatment center. They had an advisory council um, and then through that advisory council, we formed an Ohio um, coalition. So it's called the Ohio Bleeding Disorders Council. And uh, when that first formed, some parents sat on that with patients and then all of our treatment center, um, we have eight hemophilia treatment centers in the state of Ohio. So all of them had a, a seat on the council and then all five of our uh, our foundations had a seat on that table. And so I served as the parent lead um, for that and started really learning how to advocate for our family and families like ours. And so I organized families to go to the state capitol and share their story through our state advocacy day. Um, and that's really where I found most of my passion was you know, how we could share our stories to make a difference. And so I um, kind of had something I wanted to share a little bit with you all just to show you. I get really nervous when I speak, but I really found that if I do so um, with a coordinated um, effort that I do much better. And so I um, started putting these little packets together. So it's just a little um, photo book and whatever the advocacy ask was, I know you guys are preparing for it and maybe something that they're going to do too, but I would just talk a little bit about our family. So um, just a little bit about who I was, so I wouldn't forget to introduce myself. Um, and then just some, some pictures of our family, um, just so the person that you can are talking to can relate and then um, always you know start off with like a 101 so just whatever part of the hemophilia bleeding disorder story that you're comfortable with just sharing a little bit of that story and then uh, going into your ask so I know that you guys have a couple asks today so just whichever one that you're most comfortable with um, just sharing a little bit of detail about that so this was um, you know talking about our out-of-pocket cost um, and then just remember to put your put your your story into the story of the community story. And so for us, um, you know, in Ohio, we have a, a large population like California does. Um, and so, uh, Colton was, um, I forget what year this was that I last put it together, um, but you can see like I found the stats on how many severe hemophiliacs there were so I could point to exactly where Colton is in the in the stats that there's um, 270 severe hemophiliacs in the state of Ohio and Colton is one of them. And so just being able to make sure that you share your story really clearly um, and then I always finish up with a thank you. So sending them back a thank you card. So it reminds me to thank them and send it out. So um, this was how I kind of found my, my place in the community was I started sharing stuff like this with other families. So, um, so just, you know, doing those kinds of things to make sure that um, you're being clear and concise in your story. Um, and so then that way that is, um, is a good way to be really involved. So I kind of shared too, um, I got involved with our children with medical handicaps, uh, which is our title five or the um, children um, maternal child health block grant dollars go to our title five program. Um, but then also those, those dollars are also spent um, by the counties. And so if you're not very close to the capital or not engaged with the, the state, 
program, uh, your county health district or health department sometimes has an advisory council that you can also be a part of. So take some time to look into that. I also served um, with that organization uh, locally and you know it's 10 minutes from my house. And so I would go and I'd share with other special needs families. Um, and then your chapter usually has some kind of um, advocacy or the treatment center has some kind of advocacy efforts that you can get involved in or advisory councils. I, I also served in those capacities too. So um, just getting to a point where you can share your family stories would be really great. Um, one of the things that I, um, really found myself doing that I didn't realize was uh, kind of growing um, my advocacy skills was just building relationships locally. Um, so because we are in a space where we're highly impacted by issues that happen around healthcare, I was going to local organizations and just kind of listening and uh, building relationships with them. So like your county commissioners, um, your state, or your, sorry, your local um, elected officials. If they have town hall or office hours, just attend because you just never know building those relationships with people um, before maybe they go off and run for state representative or state senator or even Congress or uh, US Senate. If you can get on the ground with them when they're, when they're building up to their political futures, um, it's really important and really impactful. Um, we did not have a lot of money uh, when we were young, especially. And so, you know, going to these town halls and just being somebody there to be supportive and just sharing our story um, about hemophilia and bleeding disorders was always um, super important. And so uh, we really found that doing that locally um, kind of built a relationship with our local uh, officials in a way that, uh, whenever my state representative was getting ready to term out in Ohio, we have eight year uh, terms. And I went to her to see if um, she knew who was gonna potentially run for state representative uh, the next time around. She actually was surprised because she thought that I was coming to her to ask to run for state representative and I was not. Um, I uh, still get really nervous speaking in front of people. Um, I've never, thought I would run for office and never had a, an intention to be political at all. I really love working on policy work, but that was not really kind of what I was thinking. And so um, she had asked me uh, if I was kind of thinking about it in 2016. Uh, I was not. And then uh, the, the whole election cycle changed and President Trump won that election. And I knew healthcare was going to be a huge uh, issue that was going to be something that we all talked about, uh, especially around the Affordable Care Act and how um, you know, the changes were gonna potentially come with uh, you know, it going to the Supreme Court. And so I decided, what the heck, why not? If uh, President Trump can win, why can't Randy Kleitz uh, win a little county like mine? And so I did, I decided to run for office. And uh, when I ran for office, I really did so mostly. how high cost medical needs impact um, middle income families every day. And so I did so and uh, I was in a three way race and I actually ended up winning and I was not expecting that. And so then after winning the primary, I was kind of putting on the hat to, you know, really went run to win. And I did so and I got to serve for two years at the state house, um, being a mom of a child with hemophilia and leukemia. Um, it, it really gave a great perspective to the legislature, to the health committee that I was there representing our community. Um, and so super exciting to be able to serve. And I don't know that um, I can talk any of you into it, but I would love to ask if any of you are interested in running for office and uh, you would like to talk to somebody, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about it. I think we need more more families uh, that are impacted by everyday decisions that are made at the state houses around the country um, to run for office. So I'd be happy to ask for any questions at all. If anybody has any, uh, you're welcome to throw them in the chat. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions at any time. Thanks, Randy. Um, so you can also, I believe, raise your hand 
and I can actually allow you to talk if you have a question or you can put your question in the chat box. So um, I will ask a question quickly and while we wait and see if there's any others that pop up, but um, do you have any sort of quick um, you, you gave us definitely some great pointers um, in terms of like, you know, your little, your, um, you know, your index cards that you put in your photo album with your talking points. And in a moment, we're going to go through and um, go over the issues with folks for board, you know, Tuesday or for Wednesday, I should say. Um, but do you have any other sort of, you know, summary pointers as they prepare for their meetings and um, that they should keep in mind for meeting with legislators? And then I'll go ahead and ask this one as well that just came into the chat, which says, does Colton participate in your advocacy endeavors? So um, both great questions. And I'll start with the, the question that was in the chat first, because it's the easiest one. So uh, Colton does not participate in advocacy very often. Um, I have had him attend Washington Days and our um, state advocacy days. He does know some of his elected officials, um, but he has not been real engaged on his own. It's mostly just uh, when he's with me, he will he will go and share his story if it's very pointed. And that's the, the kind of answer your question, Lynn. I think the, the best thing that you can do is really have that elevator speech ready to go uh, based off of, you know, if the coalition gives you um, or the council gives you three talking points, like three things that they're really looking to do. Find the one that you are most passionate about and have your two minute elevator speech ready to go at all times about that because you just never know. Um, policy and political stuff is all local. You just never know when you might potentially go to the grocery store and see an elected official. Um, and those are usually the times when you can get the most done because when they're in their offices or when you're on a call with multiple people, sometimes it's harder to get your, um, to get your issue addressed. Uh, but when you can see them out organically, I think those are when you have the best opportunities to kind of get um, anything done and uh, to get your awareness raised, so. Great, um, somebody asked if you could show the package again. So maybe if you could hold up your little, um, so it's basically like a small photo album, like a, like a three by five or four by six size, right? It's a four by six and I just, I can literally get them at Target or Walmart or the um, Walgreens sometimes has them. And then I just use index cards. So um, this one is a, you know, just a plain index card. One side is lined and then the other side is just plain. When Colton was little, I would have him um, kind of color a little, um, you know, picture on there of our family if I didn't want to share one of our actual families. Um, but I, like I said, play to your thing. Like I'm known for forgetting to introduce myself um, because I just get so nervous whenever I'm speaking in front of people. So um, just, you know, that's usually what I usually start off with is just our introduction. And anytime you're doing these kinds of things, you want to find a way to kind of connect with a person that you're speaking to. So, um, you know, if you look up your elected official before you go and find out that they have a science background, then you really want to get into the science part of, or, you know, the genetics of hemophilia. Um, if you find out they have a health background, then you want to address like um, how the clotting cascade works. So, um, so those are kind of the things that I had had done in the past. And then, you know, we all use our EOBs and this is really old information. It's from 2016. Um, but just anything that you to the story that you're trying to tell based off of the ask that you're going into the meeting for. Um, so for me, this one, I was really trying to show the cost of clotting factor. So I used a portion of my um, insurance. So I went to my insurance benefits and printed out a little thing on that. And then this was something that our coalition, our council um, in Ohio has the stats on our website. And I don't know, I'm pretty sure you guys probably have it at the, the um, treatment center level or at the council level too. Um, so that's just what I put together. And then I always took a note card in with me to ask questions. And I, I always feel like if you can leave that meeting with a question um, so you can follow up with them, that's a win in advocacy because you want to be able to follow up with a, a lawmaker to build that relationship. So, and that's as simple as it is because usually when you are speaking to your lawmakers, you have about 10 minutes or so 
Um, so just making sure that you stick to your points is why I like putting these together. Awesome. So um, great. Thank you, Randy, for all of that. Um, so we are, um, we're going to move on to have time to cover our issues here, but we appreciate um, appreciate so much you joining us today to share those tips. And um, I know that that was super helpful and we're gonna tie into some of those tips as we talk about our issues here. So appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Good luck, everyone. I wanna thank um, our sponsors of Future Leaders and Legislative Day, um, Takeda Biomarin, HF Healthcare, Santa Fe Genzyme, the National Hemophilia Foundation, Every Life Foundation, and Solio Health, as well as our public policy and advocacy webinar series sponsors, Takeda, Biomarin, HF Healthcare, and Santa Fe Genzyme. They've all helped make this possible today. So thank you for joining us, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.